All right, everyone. Good morning. As you can see, I'm not in the studio today. Uh, unfortunately, I caught that uh, stomach bug that seems to be going around. So uh, this is <laughs> why we're in, in this configuration today. But class must go on. So welcome. We're in session seven of our course. And today we're going to be talking about events in Southern Africa in the 18th and 19th century. So we're going to look at the rise of the Zulu kingdom, the Amazulu or the people from heaven um, and their great general King uh, Shaka. Um, and, you know, this time, this year, I've been really thinking a lot about uh, figures like Shaka and Sunni Ali, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and also uh, Dessaline, those of you that are from Haiti, you know Dessaline. These men were amazing generals, but perhaps not the best administrators. And sometimes it's important for us to realize that, you know, everybody doesn't have both sets of skills. You know, you can be a great warrior and not be a great administrator. You know, they're not mutually exclusive, uh, uh, you know, talents. So we see, in, and even, even Sean Goat, um, the king of the Oyo Empire, who, you know, becomes the spiritual entity among uh, uh, Yoruba, practice, uh, Yoruba practitioners, um, they usually have violent ends to their lives um, because they're so good at fighting that they, don't, they just don't stop. They don't stop fighting. Um, and Shaka has an end that's very, um, very violent. So we're, we're going to learn from that. We're going to learn about Shaka's rise. We're going to learn about the traditions around it. And then by the time class ends, we're going to be talking about the coming of Europeans into Southern Africa and the impact that that had on the newly created political situation that resulted from Shaka's empire building to uh, increased population size due to uh, the introduction of corn in the area. So there's a lot of variables at play that make this a very interesting time period to study, um, an interesting region to study. And you know, 2023, we still see the effects of European settler colonialism in that region. So uh, today's also gonna be a little different. I'm going to uh, play actually a lecture um, that discusses this topic. This is still me, uh, this is from last year. Uh, and that way, just in case I have anything going on, I can just go. But when it comes to question and answer period, um, that will be live. So we'll so save your questions for the middle and the end as always. And um, excuse me, we'll go from there. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll get started. So this lecture is on the Zulu, and when we come back out of it, I will uh, tell you what uh, any updates uh, about the information that I need to. So make sure you're taking notes, and uh, yeah, we'll go from here. That we have this. All right, so today is session seven of our uh, eight week course and dealing with African world history from 7 11 to 1896. Today we will be uh, moving our conversation to Southern Africa and uh, we'll go over these three things. We'll talk a little bit about what we covered in week six. Uh, We'll talk about the factors that led to the development of large kingdoms in Southern Africa in the 18th and 19th centuries. And we'll talk about how these kingdoms responded to European uh, colonial expansion. The song that I was playing, uh, Many Men by 50 Cent, connects to what, one of the figures that we'll talk about today, which is Shaka Zulu, because uh, his life actually ended because uh, he was killed by many men, including his brothers. Uh, and somewhere his heart did turn cold, and we'll talk about what happened in his life uh, that led to his downfall, his rapid rise and his quick downfall, because Shaka Zulu was only king for about 12 years um, before uh, he is assassinated. So we will get into all of that today, so we'll be talking about events and personalities and movements, and we should have a, a very good discussion. So like always, this first session is recorded. The first section is recorded. We'll go for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, then we'll do a Q and A. Um, and then we'll have another uh, 20 minute, 20, 25 minutes. And then we will have open discussion, which is unrecorded. 
And again, like for the last two weeks, I'm also joined uh, by Daniel Roberts III, who is uh, co-facilitating with me today, who let you all in, and who will be saying something toward the middle of the class about giving us some uh, further information about something you may, uh, may be familiar with, but whose origins you may not be. So we'll talk a little bit about that toward the middle of the class. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat. They'll be addressed in Q&A, or you can wait till the Q&A and you can raise your hand and we can address those. If you have questions or comments that you don't want to be recorded, save them until the end and we'll turn the recording off and you'll be able to ask, uh, uh, ask or say those things uh, in that form. All right, so where are we at? So we're in week seven, we've been moving. So we started the class talking about North Africa, Northeast Africa, and the uh, uh, Moorish invasion of the uh, uh, Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. Then we moved uh, into West Africa and we talked about the great empires there, Ghana, Mali, and Songa. We talked about folks that uh, weren't in those empires as well. We talked about Ken and Bornu. We talked about queen mothers all over the continent from West Africa to East Africa. And we talked about Uganda. We talked about Central Africa last week in the reign of Queen Njinga and, and other uh, uh, folks in that region. And we also talked about the movement of Africans to the Americas, the large scale movement of Africa, Africans to the Americas and the establishment of independent African communities known as Mukambos or Quilombos or what the Spanish call Maroon communities or Palenques uh, uh, in the Caribbean, North America and in South America. We also talked about the East African coast and we talked about its connection to uh, uh, trade routes that went into the Indian Ocean world and to China and the richness that was there. The, um, oops, let me do something quickly. Forgot to do that. All right. Um, the, Many of the themes that we've talked about um, throughout the seven weeks, uh, the, the previous six weeks, you'll see repeated in what we discussed today uh, in terms of the importance of trade, the effects of the environment and new things being introduced into the environment on uh, the lives of people. And we'll also talk about um, uh, the position of clean mothers because they're very important in the story that we'll talk about today. The time period that we're dealing with, so we're moving up in time as well as we move geographically. We are talking about the late 1700s and the early to mid 1800s. So the late 18th century and the early to mid 19th century is what we're talking about. Remember, this class ends at 1896. So we're making our way closer to that date. We zoom into South Africa. So let me go back to this one. So we're talking about this region here uh, in, in Africa, South Africa, and a little bit of Zimbabwe. We will talk about Zimbabwe a little bit later. Uh, when we zoom in, this is what we're talking about. These are the major kingdoms at the, in the time period that we're talking about. Again, the late 1700s, the early to mid 1800s. So you got the Cape Colony, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, Sotho Kingdom, uh, you have the Zulu Kingdom, which is not as big at the time. It gets this big, but we're not going to start where it's that big. We're actually going to start talking about these two kingdoms, Ndwandwe and Mithwewa. And my South African pronunciations are not the best, uh, so please uh, bear with me. But Mithwewa and Ndwande are the two kingdoms that, before the rise of the Zulu, were the, the main powers in this region and rising powers in this region. But we also have to pay attention to what's going on at Delagawa Bay. This is where the Portuguese are. We talked two weeks ago about the Portuguese coming into East Africa uh, uh, or the East Africans, the Swahili city-states and, and wreaking havoc there. And, and this is about 300 years after that. So they're pretty well established on the East African coast. Um, and we, we go back to this, what we talked about last week. The Spanish and the Portuguese being the first Europeans uh, out of Western Europe to start exploring the Atlantic world and then also uh, engaging folks on the West Central Coast and ultimately the East Coast of Africa. And we go back to that treaty in 1494 where the Spanish and the Portuguese agreed to separate the world amongst themselves. 
Spanish in the Western part, Portuguese get in the Eastern part. Well, as we're uh, about 300 years after this, is the period that we're talking about, and things have changed. New players have emerged in, in, in Europe. You got the Dutch, uh, the English, and the French who have all staked their claims and have done things in the Americas and uh, are uh, have essentially, um, by the time we get to the 1700s, the Portuguese are, aren't as, as powerful as they once were in, in this region. The British are playing a larger role. They're about to uh, finish their conquest of India not long after this. Um, and the, the Dutch are also weakening in power as well. So this has changed a little bit, but the Portuguese are still there. And through all these years, the Portuguese have, uh, and the Spanish, and then ultimately the British, they've connected the world through their, their naval trade in ways that the world wasn't connected, at least all of the world wasn't connected. And one of the very interesting uh, uh, results of this, and one of the things that indirectly leads to the rise of the Zulu and the other large kingdoms in Southern Africa is something very simple that many of us wouldn't think of when we think about the rise and, and, and fall of kingdoms. And it's this, it's corn. Corn. We we can we can blame corn for the rise of Shaka Zulu if you really look at it that way indirectly. So what happened? What do we know about corn? Is actually one of the greatest inventions uh, or modifications made by human beings. Uh, indigenous people in the Americas took a a, a grass with a seed with a uh, that's not that it's pretty much the original uh, corn plant is the, the seed is only like this big, but through modifications and uh, you know selective crop breeding over thousands of years, indigenous people created corn, the big stocks of corn that we have today. This is indigenous creation. So that creation that, the, and, and, and those, that those seeds start to spread out to the rest of the world as the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, uh, trade the goods that come from the Americas, other places in the world, corn maize makes its way to Africa, um, into Southern Africa from that Eastern region that was underneath the control of the Portuguese, what's now Mozambique and, and even further up the uh, East African coast. So corn gets there. Corn is a double-edged sword when it gets to South Africa. Now on the positive end, it leads to uh, greater, and initially it leads to greater uh, uh, population growth. Why? Because corn yields a lot. You can plant a little and get a lot when you, when you plant corn. So when you have more food, you can sustain more people. You know, birth rates rise and other things. So you have more corn and corn can be used to not only feed human beings, but also to feed cattle, which is what many of the communities in Southern Africa depended on. They were cattle herders, uh, the Zulu, the other folks that were around, they were cattle herders. So you could feed people, you could feed animals. So you grow your herds, you also grow your population. But there's a downside to corn. Corn evolved in a particular type of soil that needs particular types of nutrients and, and, and nitrates and all types of other chemical stuff that I won't get into. But if you don't have those things, if you don't have that type of soil, it'll yield for a, a couple of years, uh, but eventually it starts to exhaust the soil and you start to have problems. On top of that, this region of Southern Africa also went through uh, one of the periodic uh, climate changes that the earth goes through. So rainfall lessened right around the same time. So what started out as a population boom, all of a sudden there's, also, there's stress on the land uh, where the soil isn't as productive as it, once, as it once was, rainfall isn't as predictable as it once was. So you have all these people with, with, that are herding cattle, you got population growth. This is gonna cause strain in the region and cause people uh, to be in conflict uh, easier, easier, more easily than they would have been had the rainfall been right and had uh, crop production been what it needed to be. So the introduction of corn, the changing in the environment or all the context, the environmental context of the things that are about to happen occur in, which is gonna cause kingdoms to grow, become more militaristic and, and expansionist in this region. So let's get into some of the personalities. So when we look at these two kingdoms that preceded the Zulu kingdom, 
got these main characters. So these are people. Digiswano Kajobe. Digiswano, the son of Jobe, the child of Jobe. He is the leader of the Bethwewa kingdom. And he lived 1780 to 1817. His rival is Zwide Kalonga, and he runs the Ndwande kingdom. So these are the two big bulls before uh, the Zulu kingdom, the two kingdoms that are uh, fighting for uh, not only uh, grazing land for cattle and, and for, for growing crops, but also for control of trade routes, trade that's gonna be trading uh, north to uh, the coast, to the East African coast, and also trade that's going uh, uh, west to east, that's going even as far as to Southern Angola. So these are very important trade routes. So these two kingdoms are, 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 are rivals that are about to about to do battle in this region but there's other folks around as well in the background you have uh uh, Z uh, uh Zwide's mother queen mother in Tumbaze, very powerful and very influential in the life of uh uh uh, Z uh Zwide. very influential so his queen mother she's in the background among the Zulu, who at this time, the time we were talking about, are a vassal or they're a kingdom that's underneath the control of Digiswano. Digiswano uh, and his kingdom control the Zulu. They're not as big as this map shows. This is before this. They're a small kingdom, maybe only about 1,500, like a small amount of people uh, under the control of Digiswano. Among the Zulu, you have a very powerful princess. Mkabai Kajama, Princess Mkabai, very important figure. We're going to talk about her in a second. And then you later on, you're going to have Queen Nandi. But hold off for considering her for a minute because she comes into the picture later. This is the mother of Shaka. Nandi is the mother of Shaka who becomes a queen, a powerful queen mother once he takes the throne. But we'll hold off on her for a second. So these two are fighting. Dominance in the region. Zwide and Digiswan. Zwide, of course, is backed by his mother, the powerful queen mother. So this, these are the two bulls. While all this is going on, the small Zulu kingdom is really being controlled by Princess Nkabai. Very interesting story. Now, this would have just escaped history. The stuff that I'm about to tell you would have just escaped history had Shaka not been who he was. This is the, the, the Amazulu or a, a, a minor people, again, underneath the control of Digiswan. So here's what happened. You, you see, Princess Mkabai was the sister of Shaka's father. <laughs> again, these, 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 these Zulu names. Sin Zonga. Kona, Sinzanga Kona, is Princess Mkabai's brother. She's his older sister. Their father, Jama, uh, for many years only had daughters. Uh, and, and Princess Mkabai was one of those daughters. She's a very powerful woman, uh, a very smart woman, very politically astute woman. Um, so as her father uh, ages, the people among the Zulu get, are starting to get nervous because he has not produced a male heir. And uh, so what his daughter does, his daughter actually initiates the relationship between uh, Sin Zongakona's mother and King Jama and uh, uh, Shaka's father. I'm just going to call him Shaka's father now. Shaka's father is born. Then Jama dies and the son is too young to take over. So in effect, from the years 1781 to 1787, Princess Mkabai is in charge of the Zulu. She, is, she takes the, the role of regent while her brother is still too young to rule. So she becomes the ruler of the Zulu. And it's uncontested because she has accumulated such political power and backed up by her own military forces that she's able to hold the throne, the, the throne of the Zulu uh, uh, until her brother comes of age. When her brother does come of age in 1787, he, 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 he becomes 
uh, king of the Zulu. And again, they're still underneath the control of Digaswana. They're, they're a small kingdom. He takes a whole lot of wives. He has, he has about 16 wives. Um, but one woman who he has a child with, he doesn't officially marry her. She's not considered a true wife, a, a, an official wife. And this is Shaka's mother. This is Queen Nandi. This is Shaka's mother. So for the first five years of his life, he grows up near his father's house, um, in his father's corral, you know, in the, the way the Zulu have their, their housing set up. So he grows up there, but him and then his mother also gives birth to a, a girl, Shaka's sister. They're never really accepted. Um, the, you know, there's questions of his legitimacy, even though he's, he's the oldest of his father's children, he's never really accepted by the official wives and their children. So he's constantly being bullied. Him and his sister are constantly being bullied. His mother is being uh, 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 ostracized and attacked by the other wives and other people in, in the ruling family and to eventually get to the point that she just leaves. So Shaka takes, Shaka's mother takes him and his sister and she goes back to her, her own clan. But when they get there, uh, the abuse continues because uh, Shaka doesn't have a father because you know the, the mother has left uh, uh, the king. So he's abused, his sister's abused, you know, it's, it's bullied. It's not good. So his mother eventually leaves again and goes to the capital uh, where Digaswano is and goes under his protection. Now Digaswano probably did this for uh, varied reasons. You know, maybe he was just being nice and he sees this woman and her two children and says, all right, come on, I'll protect you. But he also understands that Shaka is the oldest son of one of the kings that is underneath his control. So that might have been another reason why he brought him in and say, okay, this young man might be useful at some point in the future. So Shaka comes into manhood underneath the tutelage of Digaswano. And remember, Digaswano is preparing to, 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 to fight uh, and, and, and to go to war with Ndwande, with the kingdom of Ndwande, with uh, 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 Zwide and his mother. So Shaka comes of age underneath the tutelage of Digaswano. So Digaswano at this time is one of the top uh, war generals and kings in the region. And he takes Shaka under his wing. And Shaka uh, uh, is a member of the age group that has been militarized. So in all of these cultural units in Southern Africa, the work and the labor of young men is underneath the control of their kings and they're, they're organized by age sets. So, you know, from a certain age to a certain age, you have to, you're in the, 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 the service of the king, whether that's military service, whether that's uh, looking over the king's uh, uh, herds of cattle, whether that's doing agricultural work or, or, or uh, construction work, building work, you are in the service of the state or the king. So in this case, this what had normally been something that was really geared toward uh, agriculture and, and looking after cattle in this context becomes more militaristic. So these aid sets are becoming more like standing armies of, of young men. So Shaka is in these and uh, in the skirmishes between these two kingdoms, Shaka distinguishes itself as a capable military leader, as uh, uh, he's known for being incredibly physically fit um, he's known uh, as someone that was constantly studying tactics and he would pick Digaswano's mind about why are you doing this, what should we do this, and, and how do we move and that type of thing. So he's shown himself to be a very capable young man. So all that bullying and stuff that he has sustained, very young, uh, this has made him a, a very hard person, uh, a very uh, a determined person, a very uh, ambitious young man because uh, he wants to right the wrongs that he feels were done to him, his mother, and his sister. So he is learning from this great leader, Digaswato. Let's fast forward a little bit to 1868. So after a relatively short reign, his father dies of natural causes. And these are just an image of, this is not during this time period, this is later on, but this is kind of what these, these age set the uh, Zulu warriors uh, look like later on in the 19th century. So this is, uh, during Shaka's time, this is later on, but uh, 
you could, it's not a stretch to say this is what it looks like. Shaka's father dies in 1816. Shaka's away. Remember, he's serving under Digga Swayo, but Digga Swayo says, look, uh, I want you to go back and take over control of the Zulu kingdom. I trust you. I've seen that you're a good warrior and uh, I might need you and your folks when I go into final battle with uh, Zwide. So you go back and you take over the Zulu kingdom, even though uh, there were other people in line. Remember, his father had 16 wives and a whole bunch of kids. So he had a whole bunch of half brothers and stuff, uh, but he's backed by one of the more powerful general kings in the region. So Shaka goes back to the Zulu and he takes the throne. Now his aunt, Princess Mkabaye, who had served as, as regent, who had controlled the kingdom before her brother was able to take over, uh, she sees all this and she's a political power broker. So she sees this young man Shaka, she had known him when he was a child, of course, and she sees that he has the support of Digaswayo and that he is a capable military leader. So she backs his, his, his uh, ascension. So with the support of Degaswayo, with the support of his aunt uh, uh, initially, he takes over in 1816. He takes over control of the Zulu kingdom. Again, there's, there's a small group of people underneath their, their, their vassal to Degaswayo. Now here's where things start to get interesting. When Shaka takes over, he initiates a bunch of changes, things that he had seen in, 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 in Degaswayo's, uh, when he served in, in Degaswayo's army, um, but then innovations of his own that he made. The first, all of these armies at the time in this region, they fought with a long throwing spear and a big, and, and, a, and a small shield. Shaka decides to change that. And he actually invents a new weapon. It's a short stabbing spear. So instead of throwing it, you stab people with it. Uh, so that becomes the primary weapon of his army, his Zulu army. Uh, the age grades like that I talked about, the Amaboto, these are the age grades that you had to serve the king. He made service in those a lot longer. So let's say before service in those was between the ages of 13 and 23. And then after that, you could get married and, and do your own thing. He makes it until 40. So people had to be in his service, uh, in military service. The men had to be in his military service from uh, teenage years to 40. You couldn't get married till you were 40. So you were tied to him. And you can imagine what that's like. A, a, a bunch of men that are not allowed to get married, how much anger and rage uh, that may uh, uh, put into that the, into those troops. So when you put them out the battle, uh, they're, they're ferocious. This is one of the innovations that he made. He also devised new battlefield tactics, uh, such as his bull and horn tactic, where he have a portion of his military charge and then some of his fastest runners encircle his enemy and then collapse upon him. So these were some of the innovations that he made. And he was incredibly successful but he got to put his troops to the test at one of the most influential battles in this, the region uh, of Southern Africa. When Digaswayo and uh, Zwide go to battle in 1820, one of the most important battles in African history. At this battle, Digaswayo calls on Shaka and he says, look, well not, they didn't use a phone, but he calls on Shaka and he says, hey, uh, about the, this is going to be the final confrontation. We're going to finally put an end to Ndwande, and I'm going to be the, the ruler of the entire region. I'm going to control the trade routes. I'm about to be big time. And since you are under me, I need you to come and fight in this battle. I know your skills. Uh, you know, you, you trained under me. I know what you can do. So Shaka agrees, and he brings his troops, and they're about to engage in the, uh, to join Digaswayo, and they're about to engage in the battle with Zwide. The problem is, once the battle starts, Shaka does not instruct his troops to fight on behalf of Digaswayo. He holds them back. Digaswayo ends up losing that war with uh, uh, Ndwande, and he's, he's, he's done with, and Ndwande wins. It's a short, uh, uh, he celebrates his victory because after a few years, Shaka takes advantage of uh, the chaos he reconstructs Digaswayo's army 
and then he goes to battle with Ndwande. He saw Ndwande as someone he could probably easily defeat. So he let Digaswanu, he, he held back his troops, Digaswanu loses, and then Shaka, in the chaos of all of this, finally, later on, defeats uh, 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 Zwide. And then the Zulu become the top dog in the region, the top bull in the region, controlling all of this. And he doesn't stop. He continues to expand. And the people that come under his control become Amazulu. So he takes it from a small group of people to an empire with these new military tactics, uh, uh, his shrewdness in letting his, his mentor get, uh, and his troops get killed in battle. Uh, and he begins to expand this kingdom using these various tactics that he has come up with. So I, I want to stop for a second so you can learn more about the effects of what Shaka did, Shaka's innovations, and how in a very surprising way, Shaka's innovations are actually still with us. So I'm going to turn it over for a second to, uh, uh, to Daniel, and he's going to fill you in on something that you may not be familiar with. So Daniel, it's, uh, it's, it's yours. The floor is yours. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yep. They're on mute. Oh, okay. So um, we're going to be talking about how Shaka's warfare innovations had an influence on what we now consider Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. So the, fa the father of scouting was a British, um, was, a, um, was a British military officer by the name of Robert Baden Powell. And his, um, his military career began in the year 1876, where he was dispatched to India. After his service there, he will also work in the Balkans, Malta, and Southern Africa. And obviously it was during his time in Southern Africa where he would have familiarized himself with Zulu culture. Um, but before we get into that, we need to talk about something called the Noble Savage. It's a very ra um, racist and prejudiced idea, which basically says that because tribal or primitive peoples um, because the um be there because they're free from the dangers of civilization, the sins of it. That means that they're more pure, and that they have certain aspects that um that Europeans could learn from, in a sense. And so this was popularized primarily during the 18th and 19th centuries. Now, um. Now, um, Powell's um, contact with the Zulus didn't occur into, um, until after Shaka um, was alive and after he was active in warfare. So this, was, this wasn't during Shaka's time. But um, one of his successors, King Setshwaya, he led a crushing defeat of the British army in the year 1879. And Powell wasn't involved, wasn't involved with this conflict, but he was well aware of its aftermath. Because after this, the British developed a very strong admiration and sense of respect for the um, for the Zulus because of their um, their fighting, and so because because of their strength and because the British felt that any so-called um, lesser group of people who could overcome them in battle must be a people worthy of respect. Powell saw, um, saw this defeat as an opportunity to adopt some African um, mar um, martial arts tactics into training for um, British people. So in 1907, Powell hosted a Boy Scouts camp for 22, um, for 22 British boys, and he started adopting certain aspects that he um, recognized that um, peoples in Southern Africa um, used. So he woke them up every morning blowing a kudu horn, for those who don't know, a kudu is a type of antelope. He taught them a call and response chant that he heard from the Zulus in Southern Africa, which he called In Ganyama Ganyama. He noticed that the Zulus performed certain um, dances, if you could call them that, before they went off to war. He mimicked that and adopted those into the um, etiquette of Boy Scouts. And he also 
notice certain initiations that um, Zulu boys had to undergo before they become, could become men. So when a boy was to um, transition from boyhood into manhood, his um, his associates would paint him and um, would cover him in a white paint, and they would put him in the jungle for about a month on his own, armed with nothing but a spear. If he, if the men from his um, village caught him in the jungle while his paint was still on, they would kill him. But if he survived the entire month before the paint could wash off, when he came back to the village, he would be welcomed as a fully initiated um, man. So Powell looked at this concept and he said that, he, he basically said that he feels like the um, British could learn something from them. He felt that British boys could only, British boys wouldn't be able to survive something like this unless they were trained in Boy Scouts which had taken inspiration from the um from these um African warriors. So that is, I believe that is all I have. That's that's um that's all I have, Clyde. All right. Thank you for that. So you can see the the that the influence of Shaka, because we got the scouts in Canada, we got the scouts in the United States, all based off these African ideas. So Shaka's innovations and these things, they went all the way down to his, uh, one of his uh, descendants. Uh, well, not blood descendants, not, Shaka didn't have any children, uh, but one of his, uh, uh, that would be his nephew, uh, uh, Suswayo, because the tactics that Shaka introduced were still being used uh, uh, even after his uh, generations after he, he was uh, gone. So what happens to Shaka? And, and I'll talk about this and then we'll, we'll go to our Q&A. So, you see Shaka's reign is only 12 years, 1816 to 1828. And he has that big victory over Adonde in around 1823. 1823, he has that, that victory over Adonde. So he's the undisputed ruler of this region and he's continuing to expand. Um, but then something happens. Something happens in 1828, 27. His mother dies. His mother dies. Queen Nandi dies, who's also the Queen Mother. So she's been very powerful in all this behind the scenes. You know, she's Shaka never takes a wife, he never has any children. Um, his mother is his primary advisor. So you remember this relationship that he has with his mother, you know, the, the fact that they were ostracized so many places, moving from place to place. And and when he actually when he becomes king, one of the things I forgot to mention, when he becomes king, he actually kills all of those many of those people. His half brothers and 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 the, the women that were making fun of him and his mother and anybody that was against uh, them when he was a child he remembered all that and he has them killed. Uh, but he has so many half brothers that many of them uh, he keeps alive because they they side with him. But when his mother dies in 1827, it's, it's Shaka kind of kind of goes uh, he goes crazy. I mean, there's no other way to to, to end his grief. He, he becomes even more despotic. Um, and he wants the entire nation to share in the grief that he's having. So he, uh, he kills a whole, uh, thousands of heads of cattle. He doesn't allow anybody to drink milk because those are representations of, of motherhood. Um, he wants everybody to feel the grief that he is feeling. Uh, this, is a, this is just too far for uh, many of the folks in the royal family, including his aunt, who's still around, who still has power, uh, Princess uh, Mkabai, who's been around. You know, she's the one that you know initiated or essentially made his father king. She's the one that allowed him to be king when he came back from exile. And now she conspires with his brothers, his half brothers, uh, Dengane, and and there's another uh, and a few other ones. To, to take Shaka out. And that's exactly what they do in 1828. Shaka is assassinated by a, a number of his brothers, led by Dengane, and, and all this was orchestrated by Princess uh, M. Kabaye. So all of this happens. Uh, and so Princess M. Kabaye, the, the survivor that we, we, we know her as in this political power broker, organizes Shaka's assassination. So he is killed. Uh, by his his brothers, um, and then his brother Dengane takes over 
you know, again, backed by his aunt, uh, Princess Nkabayi. So this is how Shaka's reign ends. During his life, he has expanded the Zulu from being a small vassal people to Degaswano to being an empire in their own right. Um, a number of ripple effects happen because of uh, the Zulu. Uh, the fighting that happens. So we got these first, the first two kingdoms, Degaswaru's kingdom, uh, uh, Zwide's kingdom. You have a group that leaves uh, Zide, uh, Zwide's kingdom and forms the kingdom of Gaza, which is near Mozambique. So you have a, an offshoot that leaves them. Of course, Shaka emerges as, as being a, a, a from a, being a vassal of Degaswano to being a kingdom in his own right. Uh, another group breaks off from Shaka. One of Shaka's generals, uh, Mzili Kazi, breaks off from Shaka and he forms the Ndebele nation that ultimately makes its way all the way to Zimbabwe. So these groups are moving, these militarized groups are moving to different areas in the region. So it's a ripple effect uh, because of all the, the warfare that's happening. Uh, South African historians refer to this period as the, as the Infocane, which means the crushing of the spreading. Uh, it's a term that's contested, but there's a lot of conflict going on in the region at this time. Um, and so you see one of Shaka's generals moves from, uh, he breaks off from Shaka uh, right before he becomes really despotic and they move all the way up here and they're actually gonna move again uh, later on. But we'll get into that uh, as we come back from the break because a lot of this again is influenced by the presence of, uh, or the growing presence of not only the uh, uh, not only the, the agricultural uh, pro uh, problems that we were talking about that are causing issues, but also the presence of this growing Cape Colony. What this is uh, are the Dutch and the British uh, here are starting to expand further east, and you also have the Portuguese that are operating out of here that are also trying to expand their networks. So all of this movement is happening right at the point where greater European presence is uh, coming into the region. So we're gonna see the effects of that in a second. So let me stop for a minute. All right, <clears throat> everyone. So yes, uh, that is the first half of the recording. Uh, for those of you that joined a little bit later, we're not in the studio today because I have that stomach bug that's going around. So. Uh, we're gonna open up our, our, our Q&A uh, now, and then we'll go back into the lecture. Um, so I see there was something in the chat earlier, I'm gonna address that, and then I'll address uh, Mr. Francis. Um, for most of Shaka's innovations, because he knew he was being called upon for military support. Um, yes, and uh, he knew um, that ultimately he was going to be able to be a leader uh, since he was now the king of the Zulu. So, innovating and creating an army in his image, an army that was going to be fast and, and vicious and well-disciplined um, became his priority and the new weapons that he created uh, to make warfare uh, more efficient, to kill people more efficient because the, the throwing spears, the way warfare used to be fought, they would throw the spears and then, um, you know, sometimes they would hit, sometimes they wouldn't. And there were even reports of the enemy picking the spears up and handed them back to uh, the people that threw them and then they would line up and do it again. So it was very uh, strange. Uh, but Shaka said, no, we're putting an end to this. Uh, how did Shaka know he was going to be a leader? Um, he, when he comes back from Digiswayu, he uh, is put in the position of king. Um, and a lot of that is motivated by revenge. A lot of that is motivated by what Digiswayu has uh, trained him to be. Uh, so he knew he was going to be uh, the leader, and he had ambition. He's just like many of the leaders that we've talked about, you know, Sunni Ali, uh, Shango, uh, Dessaline, um, and then a little bit later on, who we'll talk about next week, Tedros of Ethiopia. These were men of ambition. Even his, his aunt, his aunt was an ambitious woman, so you don't have to look too far to see that type of political ambition to, to, to rule um, and to make the Zulu a great nation. So um, yeah, he was able to, to do all of that. And in, in terms of the women, a lot of these women had to marry older men. 
so you had younger girls with 40 year old guys, 50 year old guys, people having multiple wives uh, because the young men were in the military service. Now how that impacted directly on uh, women and their organizing, um, I'm not completely sure. Um, a lot of the records um, when it comes to the everyday women among the Agma Zulu um, aren't where they need to be. So you'll hear a lot of stuff about the rural, royal women, uh, but uh, not sure how that impacted the everyday women. Uh, Mr. Francis, go ahead. Good morning, Dr. Ledbetter and everyone. I just want to make an observation here. The founder of the Boy Scouts, Baden Powell, apparently incorporated in his initiation things he learned from the Zulus. Yet for all, there was a black man named Dr. Howard McCurdy in southwestern Ontario who attempted to join a Boy Scouts there. And the leader of the Scouts told him, nope, you're not welcome here. Go and find yourself a black scout. Go and make a black scout. So I thought that was interesting. A white person learned from the blacks, and then another white person turned around and used that in a discriminatory manner against the black. Uh, my question for the day is this. How did the tribalism and intra-kingdom rivalry used by Europeans to their advantage? How did they use that to their own advantage? Yeah, hold off on that because the second half of class deals with that exact question, particularly how the Cape Colony spreads. Um, we're going to talk about that. So that's going to be answered in the second half of class. When we Thank you. Uh, Robin, go ahead. Hey. Um... Hey man, I hope you uh, get better soon, first of all. Appreciate that, and all the other well wishes in the chat. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, my question is, so this thing about when Shaka came in and said, hey, now you guys gotta like uh, stay in service till 40. Did, were there any like uh, on record uh, protests, revolts, anything ag against that? But by the, yeah. Not that I know of. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that many of his brothers and some of the other people that were in leadership were already above that age. So they're going to benefit from having <laughs> those age groups as well. So they're not just under the regular shock, they're also underneath individual generals in Shaka's army, his brothers and other folks that have distinguished themselves. Uh, so there's this chain of command that uh, probably would have made resistance, you know, not an effective option. But I'm not sure. I got to look to see if there's any accounts of folks uh, saying no, nah. and that, you know what, the, no, I'm thinking about it, that may have been one of the reasons why you had these breakaway groups, you know, certain generals that uh, eventually left Shaka and go form the Indebele and other people, um, because they, they kind of saw what was eventually going to happen, um, and, uh, you know, wanted to go out on their own with these new tactics and find new lands, so, um, yeah, it's interesting. Any other questions or comments? All right, so we'll get back into it. Give me one second. So let me get back into it and finish this, this conversation off and then we'll uh, 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 call it a day. So while all these, 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 this is happening, Zulu kingdoms expanding, break off kingdoms are, are, are going all over the place in, in, in Southern Africa as a result. At the same time, the Dutch uh, boers, the Dutch farmers are coming from the Cape Colony and moving east. The Dutch had been in South Africa since the, the 1600s and to this and on just in the Cape Colony. Uh, uh, on the, the Cape Colony was set up and so as the British and the Dutch and the Portuguese and the others were, were going around the Cape of Good Hope to get to, into the Indian Ocean, they needed a place 
uh, you know, to, to, to restock their ships and, and do all that. So that's what Cape Colony was set up for. It was under the control of the Dutch for many years, then the British took over, uh, not lo long before the events that we talked about happened. I think the British take over in 1790, 1795 or something like that. Uh, but the British take over Cape Colony and the Dutch are already there. And uh, at the, at not long afterwards, the, the British outlawed the slave trade. The Dutch had been enslaving uh, indigenous people in South Africa for a long time. Uh, and they uh, are upset that the British are instituting, they're going to outlaw the slave trade, they're eventually going to outlaw slavery. Uh, so the Dutch want these practices to continue. And also, they, they're growing and they want more land. So they start leaving the Cape Colony and going out into these other areas of South Africa and coming in contact and conflict with the folks that are already there. One such war that happened. So right around the time that Shaka is, uh, two years after Shaka has become uh, uh, the, the king in Zululand, which is further up north, you have the great Kosa War of 1818, where you had the Kosa leader in, in Lamble and the, the Kosa spiritual leader Makana, who had organized uh, a, a, a Kosa leadership group that was against European Dutch settlerism uh, as it was coming into this region. So we're talking about this part of South Africa. Uh, and, but the problem was, and I talk about this in the sellouts class, if you want more information on this, one of the Kosa leaders decides to go against uh, Ndamle and Makana for his own personal gain. And he actually sides with the Dutch and the British against the Kosa. And, and the, a war happens and because of his betrayal and, and, and also because of the, the, the weapons that the Dutch and the British have, they're able to, to win this war. But the funny thing is, uh, so just remember that name of the seller, uh, Gaika. Gaika does this, he supports the Dutch and British against the, 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 the coastal leaders that are fighting to, to keep the land. But then what happens? The government, however, after the war was over, some of the coastal leaders came and they wanted to make peace, but the, the, the British and the Dutch wouldn't make peace. Uh, and they began burning houses and taking people's cattle. And at, at last, the commando went back to the colony with another 30,000 cattle taken from the starving blacks. Uh, Gaika, for whose good the war was supposed to have been fought, was forced to give up nearly 3,000 square miles of the best coastal land, which a few years later was handed over to white farmers. He is said to have remarked to a British official, when I look at the large piece of country which has been taken from me, I must say that though protected, I am rather oppressed by my protectors. So he had run to the British and the Dutch uh, to support him against the other Kosas, uh, and they did, and then they went around and, and, and took his land. And I love what this white missionary said, we use Gaika as long as he served us. When he failed to conquer in Dembali, we did so ourselves, and then we took his country. So. This is what betrayal gets you. So this is what this is how the the the, the they're spreading. The, the the Dutch and the British are spreading from the Cape Coast into the lands. They they take they take over the coastal lands, and now they're coming into contact with the Zulu. So when this happens, this is during the reign of Shaka's uh, uh, immediate successor, Dingane. Dingane gets assassinated, uh, I mean, Shaka gets assassinated by his brother Dingane. Dingane becomes king. When he becomes king, he inherits Shaka's army and his military, but this is the same time that the Dutch are making their way uh, into the region. Let me get back to that map. So the Dutch are coming, they conquered the coast, they're moving up, so they're coming into contact with the Zulu. When they get there, uh, the young uh, king Dingane, uh, uh, goes on the offensive. He sees them coming. He doesn't like what's about to happen. He, he probably heard of what happened with the Kosovo War. He knows that these people are coming for land. So he actually invites some of the board settlers to come under the, the, the auspice of a party and their, their leadership. And he says, hey, you Dutch, why don't you come and we'll have a feast for you guys and we can talk about how we can best incorporate you into the land. The Dutch come uh, to this party and he says, oh yeah, by the way, just leave your guns outside because uh, you know this is just a celebration. There's no need to be armed. So when the Dutch go uh, and, and they're sitting down uh, for the party, all of a sudden, uh, uh, Ningane uh, says, seize the wizards. Amabane Abba, 
uh, the Kathi seize the wizards and they attack the Dutch and they kill uh, 500 of, of, of the Dutch in 1838. Of course, there's going to be a backlash to this. Uh, in the background of all of this, uh, there has, there's also some infighting among uh, uh, the, the ruling family of the Zulu, because you know all these brothers, these half brothers, all these people. Uh, so Dengane, uh, one of his brothers, Mpande, is, uh, uh, doesn't want to be under the rule of his brother anymore. So after this massacre, he actually goes to the Boer leader and he says, if you help me uh, overthrow my brother, I'll help you. And a alliance is made between one of Shaka's other half brothers in Pande, who was considered a relatively weak man. Uh, no one respected in Pande. Uh, they said he cared about eating and, and being with women more than anything else. So in Pande becomes, uh, uh, forms an alliance with the Dutch against his brother Dengane and a great war, a battle happens. Uh, and a very important battle in African history, the Battle of Blood River in December, 1838. So this is some months after uh, Dengane had killed the, the Boers offensively. Uh, the Zulu, the, the Dutch continue to advance and there's a meeting at Blood River, but the Dutch learned that they, they knew they couldn't beat the Zulu in, 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 a, in just a pitched battle, they would lose. Even though they had weapons, they had guns, they would lose. So they create, which was smart on their end, uh, a great defensive structure made out of the, the wagons that they used on their wagon trail. And they put all their uh, valuables and all their uh, 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 vulnerable people in the middle and they outfitted in between the gaps of the, uh, the wagons they had their, their firearms and their cannons and, and, and all that all that machinery. So when the Zulu would charge and those tactics that we talked about that Shaka innovated, uh, they were they were mowed down uh, by this heavily protected defensive structure created by the Dutch. Uh, so in the Battle of Blood River, about three thousand Zulu soldiers uh, died um, because they couldn't penetrate the the, the, the Dutch uh, uh, battle structure. So this was a defensive battle structure. So. What should have happened is, uh, what the Zulu should have been patient and 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 encamped somewhat around them, out of range, and you could have starved them out because they would never have been able to fight an offensive war. Like they would have to stay in that defensive position. But now, then Ghana had to fight on multiple fronts because you had his half brother, or his, not his half, his full brother, and Pande had went over to the Dutch side, so he and he had troops of his own. So though they provided the offensive force of fighting against uh, 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 Dengane, and then the Dutch were able to finish that off. So Dengane is actually deposed and uh, Mpande is made uh, uh, king of the Zulu uh, and he rules. And, then, and I just wanna go back to a little bit because while all this is going on, uh, Princess uh, uh, Inca Bayi, uh, it's still alive and it's still running, it's still uh, in the background, still very powerful. And she only dies three years after Mpande uh, becomes king. So although she's very old at this time, she still has uh, some power in the kingdom. So it's funny that she outlives all of these people. Uh, so when we talk about the rise of the Zulu, a lot of that stuff could be attributed to her. But anyway, uh, Mpande rules, he, 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 because of that relationship that he forms with the Dutch, um, a lot of land, is given away, is ceded to the Dutch in return for him being crowned uh, uh, king of the Zulu. And he reigns for a long time, 1840 to 1872, uh, he reigns. Uh, toward the end of his life, his son, who Daniel had mentioned, uh, uh, Sesuayo takes over. And it's during Sesuayo's time that the Zulu really come into battle uh, with the British and inflict upon the British one of the uh, greatest losses that they've ever had uh, in Africa before ultimately treachery again and, and, and greater European firearms and finally do the Zulu in. Um, but th this, is, this is what happened. Again, another example of these uh, sellouts and treachery. Um, okay, so let me go back and we're gonna finish this off by talking about one of the breakaway groups uh, uh, that also uh, had their own experience with uh, European. So this is the beginnings. We're, we were ending off 
with Sasuayo and, and his fight against the British and in Pande and, and their, his treachery with the Dutch. These are the beginnings of what's going to, over the next few decades, be the complete, almost complete European uh, colonial project in Africa. Um, I say almost complete because next week we'll talk about Ethiopia was able to save all of Africa from being colonized. I mean, from the whole continent being colonized. Uh, Ethiopia remained independent, uh, at least the empire of Ethiopia. We'll talk about that next week. But this is, we're seeing the beginnings of European uh, colonial control in Africa proper, as opposed to just being on the coast and controlling forts and places on the coast. They're coming into Africa, and this is the beginnings of this. Uh, one of the groups that split off from Shaka, the Ndebele, under Shaka's, one of Shaka's generals, uh, Mzili Kazi, he goes to Zimbabwe to escape a, a lot of his fighting, and he takes over uh, areas are once controlled by the Shona and integrates them into his people. His son, uh, Lobengula, takes over in 1868, so right around the, during the reign of Mpande, and this is all happening in, in Zimbabwe. When Lobengula takes over, the, the British, hearing of that there's gold and other things going on, and this is after Cecil, Cecil Rhodes comes into South Africa, um, and they start exploring the, 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 the mines for diamonds and all that. Uh, they think there's more riches to be found further north in Zimbabwe. So they come in contact with Lobengula. And I'm going to end the class by showing this uh, uh, video because uh, it, it says a lot about what happened when uh, the Europeans came to Zimbabwe. So let me open that up one second. Not going to play this whole thing, just the first three minutes. Well, Cecil Rhodes really is a historical figure, another hero. He managed to get the settlers established not only in southern Odisha, southern Odisha, northern Odisha, and went as far as a bit of what was Nyasaland then Malawi, and then uh, South Africa itself. He, he, he was really the anchor of, this, of, of settlers uh, taking a route, especially the English-speaking settlers. Did he do this by fair means or foul? Is there any, uh, any settlers that take anything by fair means? <laughs> it's never, that's never done. Uh, it was uh, foul means all through. There was much of Africa, millions and millions of acres, <coughs> where there were wild animals and nothing else. We came into an area that was uninhabited, undeveloped, where roads got a charter. We go right back to before the turn of the century, where Rhodes made an agreement with Lobengula. Mr. Rhodes, the king asked what bargain you would like to make with him. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Helen, will you kindly tell him just exactly what's in it? They paid Lobengula in guns and money and many other things. I don't know the exact details. But you've got to go right back to that history before the turn of the century to find out exactly what happened. Whereas we agree to deliver to the royal kraal 1,000 martini breech-loading heavy rifles and 100,000 rounds of suitable ball cartridge, I, Lovingula, King of Matabililand, do grant concession to obtain all metals and minerals in my territories. Cecil Rhodes and the pioneers came in here. They virtually occupied this land. 
uh, they did it by continuously cheating the chiefs of the time of which my great uh, my grandfather Kuvima Zama was the Chinamora at the time and it was my grandfather that allowed Cecil Rhodes and the, the, the Roman Catholic Church priests that came with him as pioneers to build the Chishawasha mission which is about 15 kilometers east of Harare. My father was Kadungure Mapondera, son of Gorenjena, Murozin tribe. When European came in this country, they went to him and asked for friendship. He said, you Europeans, how can you ask to be my friend? Mr. Selos, he said, yes, I'm telling you the truth. I am an Englishman. What I say is true. He said, though you are an Englishman, I do not believe in what you say. You must have something behind your mind, which you are hiding. What was that? That was, your father knew that he was in need of taking the land from me. <laughs> The king says, when he gave permission for the great white chief, your lord, say, to dig for the yellow dirt, he thought one or two men would come and dig a few holes. He never expected an army to come and dig up his whole country. The king has given that permission. Does the king lie? If he says the king does not lie. The king says, if they find gold in his crawl, can they dig for it? Yes. If they find gold under his very feet, can they dig for it? Yes. The white settlers came here to dig gold, to ask for permission to dig gold, and to trade with the Africans at the time. But only to turn around the next day and usurp the whole country and to reduce the Africans into a sort of serfs and uh, to subjugate them as their colonial slaves. The land was the source of everything. It was regarded as life itself. And uh, it was, a According to the to 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 the Bengola or his father Mzirikazi, uh it was held in trust by the king for the people, and no one owned land as an individual. The king himself did not own land; it was held for the people by him. They used it as and when was necessary for whatever purpose that each individual choose, chose to use the land for. The king says he is desolate. He has betrayed his people and given away his land. Lobengula found out that he had been tricked by the settlers and suspended the agreement by a letter to the Bichuanaland Times in February 1889. He dispatched two envoys to London to see Queen Victoria. She kept them waiting for a week and then declined to see them. By 1896, there was a general uprising. We'll, we'll stop there because that's, uh, we'll get into that uprising next week. Uh, or we'll talk, a, we'll touch on it. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there today, but this is kind of, setting the picture for what we'll talk about next week. Next week is our final week of classes. We'll talk about 
what was going on. So we're making our circle back up to Northeast Africa. And we'll talk about what was going on in the Horn of Africa, uh, the Kingdom of Ethiopia. We'll talk about the Oromo people. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the Somali and what happened uh, leading up to 1896 in that region, leading up to the Battle of Ottawa. Because all the things that we talk about start to come into play. What you see here with treaties and things being signed and European penetration, all of this starts to happen. Uh, so that's what we'll get into next week. So I'm going to turn off the recording now. All right. So uh, like I said previously, I'm going to turn off the recording and uh, open it up to any uh, questions or, or comments that folks may have.